Many of you know that not too long ago, I started a weekly teacher's class where podcast listeners like yourself join me once a week for a live video call. Sometimes we just carry on conversations that get started here on the podcast, but very often these days, it's become this incredible resource where we share information and we talk about different things that are happening in our classes and how we can better ourselves as teachers. And it's really become quite a fantastic thing that I love doing each week. And there's a lot of folks who subscribe who can't make it to the live call and just watch it on the replay, which is kind of just like having another awesome podcast episode to watch or listen to every week. But not so long ago, I was traveling and we did it at this off time where all these folks in different time zones also got to join in on the live call. And we've also gotten lots of emails from people who want to join in, but the weekly time just didn't fit into their schedule or they're in another time zone. So we figured out a way to make it more possible for more people. If you enjoy the podcast and you want to have an opportunity to listen to other teachers, to have your ideas heard, and to just share in some of these conversations, this is really the perfect place to do it. And now, no matter where you are in the world, there will be an opportunity for you. Please join us. It's the J. Brown Yoga Weekly Teachers Class. You can find it at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, here we are. A point and time and space that I am in is now connecting to a point and time and space that you are in. And that's a pretty amazing thing. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks podcast. My name is Jay Brown. And today I am talking to Bernie Clark. And if you are not a regular listener and you're here mainly just to listen to Bernie, now's a good time to maybe skip ahead. Because sometimes I like to check in with regular listeners and just see how we're all doing. And honestly, I haven't done that much over the last few weeks. It's been kind of a swirl into the new year. We had some longer episodes. I've just been keeping these intros real tight, and I feel like we're out of touch. I feel like we haven't talked and like we need to catch up a little bit. So like I said, if you're just here to talk to Bernie and you're not interested in me and having a check-in, you can go ahead and skip ahead. I won't be offended. But if you're still with me, how are you doing? How is everybody? I don't know about you, but I've had like kind of a week. Those of us here on the east coast of America got hit with the polar vortex. It's been some frigid cold temperatures here. My girls were out of school for days and just kind of bunkered here in the house. My wife's in the midst of a whole thing. She's got this crafts fair that she's going to be participating in. So she's like in the basement working and and I've just been having to pick up a bunch of slack here in the house. And it's just been like a little bit, um, how should I say, like not overwhelming, like I've been on top of it all, but I've just been having to be really disciplined and having to work a lot right at a time when it feels like I should be doing nothing. You know, like I should just be hibernating and like laying around and letting it be cold winter, but I'm still, you know, working as much as I ever did, like Some weeks back, I had my friend Neil on. He's a farmer, and he was talking about how he lives, you know, with the seasons. And I feel like I don't, I don't live according to the seasons at all. It's like it doesn't matter what season it is or what weather it is. I just, I'm having to work as much as I've ever had to work. You know, I'm sure I'm not the only one. So I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm really working hard and I'm being disciplined, but it's cold out and I'd rather not be doing anything at all. And there's sort of like that uh, conflict between like what the 
cycles of the nature and the universe is communicating to me and what the like real world seems to be demanding of me. It's like, I want to, I want to rebel. I want to rebel against that. And I, I'm disciplined now enough in my life um, to recognize when I feel that and to not like do really stupid shit and really mess stuff up for myself. Like, I think that's when people like make really bad choices when they feel like life's coming in on them and they, there's no escape. And so we, we like lash out and like, you know, cheat on our wives or whatever, you know, like we do stupid shit and we like mess things up for ourselves. Well, I don't do that. Like I'm, I'm way too like cherishing of what I have. So like, I never want to do anything to like fuck up my life. So I, I'm disciplined to not do really bad stuff, but I will, I will find little forms of rebellion that I, I can get away with. And the main one for me these days is sugar. I don't have a lot of vices, but sugar is one that I just, I don't always like have control over. And I've admitted to that before here, even just at Christmas time, maybe you guys remember, I actually said something about this. I gave myself permission to let go of the discipline around sugar. Like I had been really good for like the latter I don't know, a few months of the year leading up to the holidays. And when we got to the holidays, I just said, you know what? It's the holidays. I'm going to give myself permission. I'm just going to eat sugar this week and I'm not going to try to be disciplined about it. And then after this week, I'll get back on it again. Well, let's just say I never really got back on it again. I mean, I wasn't as bad as I was over the holidays, but I, I just... I let loose and then this week it's like I I flew off the rails and I was just like shoving <laughs> cookies and crap in my face. Even at one point it really devolved to a very low point where I was talking with my daughters and I don't know why but I mentioned Twinkies and my daughters didn't know what Twinkies were and I was saying, "What? What do you mean?" you guys don't know what a Twinkie is? And I realized like my daughters have never had any of the junk food that I grew up with. I don't know about you guys. I grew up in the eighties in Los Angeles and in my house, we had what was called the cookie drawer and the cookie drawer was stocked with stuff at all times. There was always at least two different Hostess products in there, usually some Twinkies and some Ding Dongs, although sometimes it'd be the cupcakes instead of the Ding Dongs. And then there would always be a package of Oreos, sometimes regular, sometimes double stuff. Then there would be a package of Chips Ahoy. And then there would be like, I don't know, some random other stuff my mom would put in there. And it was just stocked all the time and I could go there and get a cookie whenever I wanted. I don't ever remember my parents putting any boundaries around the cookie drawer and I would just go and get stuff whenever I wanted. So that was just my childhood. And when my daughters didn't know what a Twinkie was, I felt like it was a travesty. They should know what a Twinkie is. So I went out and got some Twinkies and my wife was appalled. She said, what are you doing getting them Twinkies? And I said, I grew up on chemicals. They can have one Twinkie. They're not going to die. They have to know what a Twinkie is once in their life. This is like an American <laughs> thing, you know? I don't know why. I was like, so anyways, the funny thing about it was is they didn't even like them. They thought they were disgusting. They said, ew, this is gross. It tastes weird. Of course, I ate two of them and then felt like shit afterwards. They are completely disgusting. I can't believe that I grew up eating them. But <laughs> all of this is to say that it's just sort of like this one place where I can, I can kind of rebel and still get away with it, at least for a time, not like forever, you know. That's why I'm telling you about this. I think I realize that I, I got to get it, get it in check. And I guess... I'm just imagining that maybe I'm not the only one who finds themselves in these dark months of the year, susceptible to old patterns and just that we could be honest with ourselves about it and maybe even take some steps to address it, at least at 
first to admit it, but then maybe to not keep shoving shit in my face. <laughs> Anyways, I hope you guys aren't slipping into any old habits, and if you are, that you will also admit to them so that you at least stand a chance at not going down paths that we don't want to go. One path that I do want us to go on is today's conversation with Bernie Clark. But before we do, there is a matter that I want to speak to. I get a lot of emails from folks who listen to this podcast. They appreciate that I'm doing this kind of DIY media thing, and they often have questions about how I'm doing stuff on the back end. And one of the things that people are always interested in is how are you doing all of these live stream subscriptions and these teacher class subscriptions on your own without using these like portals and stuff? And the way that I'm doing it is using a number of different um, products that are out there that you can use to sort of decentralize the internet and put yourself at the center of what you're doing. And one of those things that I'm using is today's sponsor, Moonclerk. Moonclerk is a way for you to accept one-time or recurring payments that is infinitely better than PayPal. Not only do they provide this incredible functionality that you need, but they do it in this incredibly seamless way that makes it easy everybody involved. I've been using Moon Clerk now for like over a year. It is like one of the coolest softwares for DIY creators out there. You can start accepting recurring and one-time online payments in five minutes with Moon Clerk. And even better, you can get your first two months free when you use promo code JBrownYoga all lowercase. That's two months free with promo code JBrownYoga, all lowercase. Go to moonclerk.com. Also, another thing we've been talking about of late is this changing idea about our bodies and about how our bodies work. I have a new blog post out this week called my pain is circumstantial, and it's me kind of working through some of these ideas we've been discussing about biopsychosocial models versus postural structural biomechanical models. And one way that you might start to explore that is to do some anatomy study with my friends Leslie Kamenoff and Amy Matthews. They are the co-authors of Yoga Anatomy, and they have incredible online resource at yoganatomy.net. I have used their fundamentals course in my own teacher training programs. You can also just take that fundamentals course as a continuing education for yourself. They're both incredibly brilliant teachers. They've been on the podcast. You could go back and listen to those episodes. It's just a really invaluable resource. It's a, it's a place to get some deep yoga learning and to explore anatomy in a more embodied way and not so much of a, you know, a sterile reductionist way, but in an experiencing yourself kind of way. So I highly recommend checking it out go to yoganatomy.net. All right, so today we are talking to Bernie Clark. And Bernie has been on the podcast before. I, I talked about it last week, and I talk about it a little bit with Bernie at the beginning of the conversation, that it was at another time in the podcast, and it was an episode where I feel like maybe I, I didn't do the best job. What's interesting is, I feel there was a lot behind why that happened, and, and I sort of worked through that with Bernie in this conversation, but we also talk about his new book, Your Spine, Your Yoga, which is an incredibly valuable text. I think Bernie brings a lot of important and valuable inquiry, and I really had a good time touching base with him on all of that, 
and I'm very happy to share it with you today. Before we do, let me just drop my stuff real quick. I'm going to be in Hamilton, New Jersey, February 9th. I'm going to be in Portland, Maine, February 23rd and 24th. And I'm going to be in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, March 16th for a workshop in the afternoon and then a live podcast recording, which you can attend and be a part of. It's going to be great fun. That's March 16th in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. You can find out about those gigs and more. You can listen to the archives of this podcast. You can read that blog post that I mentioned and find out about all of my online yoga video stuff. Everything can be found at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, I will touch base with you on the other side. I'll tell you about who's coming on next week. And also I've got kind of a sweet moment to share with you. But we will do it on the other side. For now, let's get to this. Let's listen to this conversation that I had with Bernie Clark. Hello? Hey, Jay. Hey, Bernie, hold on. You got your video on. I don't have mine on. Let me say hi to you at least. Yeah. Hey. There he is. Oh, you look all professional in there. (laughs) <laughs> oh, you know, I, I actually have this curtain up only because sometimes my neighbor next door is there and he's got a little music playing. And if I put up a blanket, it it buffers mm-hmm. the sound a little bit. <laughs> Speaking okay. of which, let's turn our videos off, though, because it'll give us a better audio signal. Yep. Cool. Thank you. All right. Well, Bernie, how are you, sir? How's your day been going? The yeah, day's good. You know, the new year started. It's amazing how fast the uh, holiday season flew by, but... Now we're already into the 8th of January. It's amazing. I know. Time just keeps on a rolling and rolling. It does. It does. <laughs> Not to fix that. <laughs> well, it's a funny thing because it doesn't even really exist, which is the crazy <laughs> thing, right? <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Many different theories in physics about that. I know. I know. I'm, I'm joking about a, a dense topic, but <laughs> yes. it's, it's, it's great to talk to you again, Bernie. Thanks, Jay. It's great to be back. It's been a while. It's been two and a half years since we recorded our last podcast together. Well, there you go, time flying again. I know. And, you know, I think I might have mentioned something about this to you in my email with you, but it's particu- I've been wanting to talk to you for a while now because, you know, my biggest criticism over the years, the three plus years I've been doing the podcast is my tendency to interrupt people. And I, I think that the episode I recorded with you might be the epitome example of that (laughs) to the extent where even myself, like have trouble going back and listening to it. And, you know, I know there's, I know exactly why there's like a couple of different reasons when I look back at it, one, you know, I was just at early time on the podcast and I was at a much greener place. And I think I was a little bit intimidated because your other book was quite dense and scientific. Mm -hmm. And I think I had this worry at that time about the conversation not going anywhere or me really not being like knowing how to have a conversation with you. So I overcompensated, I think, by Mm -hmm. trying to keep things going. But also, I think that last time I talked to you, I, I think I went into the conversation with, you know, some skepticism about yin yoga. Right. I and remember that. Yeah. And I think that also I've since then, in that regard, like come to see it in a very different way, like in a similar regard to I see like stuff that came from Desika Char, where... I feel like what I get from you now, especially with your newest book, it came out even more for me, um, that, that this all started with some kind of like, like an approach or some principles or some inquiries that Paul was engaging in. Right. And I've heard you describe like you feel like you're just kind of picking that ball up and, and running with it. Yeah, that's right. Paul Paul's really the guy that uh, saw the importance of all this and tried to spread it to the world. It's, it's taken a while, but it, I feel it is actually getting up there now. Well, I think you're playing a big role in that, my friend. <laughs> and I think that, to me, what I see that is that, that there is that, but then there is also um, sort of like what some people have kind of come to mean or come to think of it as sort of like a style of practice. Mm-hmm. And that style of practice 
sometimes just means longer holds, but doesn't always have all the underpinning inquiry and principle to it. Right. Yeah. And I think that's the bias I was coming in with. And I, I think, I think I understand it in a much more nuanced, nuanced way. And lastly, at that time, you know, we were talking about joints and we were talking about fibroblasts. <laughs> right. And I think I just like, I couldn't grasp what we were talking about because like I had like a history of knee pain and, you know, I, I think there's certain words and language that you were using, like the word stress and the word mm-hmm. load. Right. Those are like triggering words for me or something. <laughs> like, like to me, when I think of stress, I think of it's like, like this super hard effort. But like when you, what you're, what I think you're saying, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, when you say the word stress, it's almost like if I'm lying back reclined, there's no stress on my spine. But if I stand up, there's stress on my spine. Right. Right. So that, that meaning of stress doesn't necessarily mean like a over hard exertion. It just means some amount of, uh, of relationship to gravity or whatever is, is happening through your spine. Right. So I've evolved uh, on that topic. And in particular, your, your most recent book about the spine, I've had like a number of um, spinal issues that I've been dealing with. Um, some like pain issues. And a lot of it had to do with me being, I feel like trapped in like an overextension, like Mm -hmm. this idea of straight spine or lengthening. Yeah. Even as much as I had been able to like understand and let go of that some, I was still trapped in it to some degree (laughs) more than I thought, you know? So I think that your more recent book, one, I didn't try to read it cover to cover, and you talk, no. about, you talk about that in the introduction. I think that's kind of important that it does have these kind of different layers to it. And this time I didn't, I, I haven't gotten all the way through it. As I said, I haven't tried to read it cover to cover, but just kind of looking up things and identifying things that were fitting with my experience, all this great stuff was coming out. Yeah, well, that's, that's good. It's meant for a reference. You don't pick up an encyclopedia and read it from cover to cover. You kind of look up the areas that you're interested in go deeper there. Mm. Well, I just say all of that to preface this conversation um, and to thank you because I really have been appreciating your writing, especially since we last spoke. Yeah, thanks, Jay. You're welcome. Now, I guess um, I know this is like the second in a trilogy, right? So are you working right. on the third one now already? or? Um, yeah, the first one was the Your Body, Your Yoga which in that there's kind of two parts. The first was an overview of kind of the the physiology of our tissues about stress and strain and uh, something called the anti-fragility curve and how fascia fits in there, how the immune system fits in, the nervous system, how all these things can contribute to restricting our range of motion. And then the second part of that first book was looking at this as it applies to the lower body from the hips down to the ankles and the feet. The second book, which you're alluding to, Your Spine, Your Yoga, really looks at the core of the body from the tip of the tailbone, the pelvis, up to the crown of the head. And then the last book that I still have to come up with is Upper Body, Shoulders, Arms. And then there'll be another volume that looks at this whole topic of symmetry and asymmetry. And when is it good? When is it bad? Mm. Each one of these books takes me about two and a half, three years to do. So I'm in a little bit of a break right now before diving into the third book. Maybe I'll start that up in the summer. I can, I can understand. They're dense and the yeah. references are deep, but I, I really appreciate it. But again, I think that can be intimidating. I was more intimidated by it in the past and seeing it more as like sources of inquiry rather than something I'm supposed to learn cover to cover has certainly been helpful in that regard. Good, good. That's the intention. Like if you're interested in, like you said, extending the spine, as you may have seen in my book there, a straight spine, which, you know, is when we really extend it, lengthen it, is not a neutral spine. A lot of people confuse that. So it's, it's got these little pieces where you can go and look in at these various topics and dive in deeper. Well, that's exactly where I wanted to start with that idea of neutral spine. And, mm-hmm. you know, I had... I know you listened to the podcast, so I had yes. Lauren Fishman on, and he seemed to be an old school kind of viewpoint that where there was this idea that like straighter spine was somehow stri- safer spine. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know for myself, like I, I started by saying that I, 
I was taught to create axial extension as the optimal positioning of my spine. Right. And I think that that was, has been really hard to break out of and caused all kinds of issues. But I am coming to some understanding more of neutral spine, but it's a really mur- kind of murky thing to identify because it is like an interoception feeling thing that would be how you identify it. And I'll give you an example. Like just recently, I spent a little time with Donna Fari, mm-hmm. and I actually had just like a very short, it was only like 10 minutes or something, 15 minutes where we were like in her studio space and she was sort of like looking at the way I was standing and kind of just giving me some ideas and observations, you know, and right. giving me some suggestions. And in the, in the suggestions she made, she had me really tilt my pelvis like and stick my butt out way more than I normally ever do. <laughs> You know, right, like, right. put that tail out way more than I normally do and like put my shoulders more forward than I normally do. Mm-hmm. And in that moment when she kind of when I got to sort of the suggestion she was saying, I did have this sensation of almost falling forward. Right. Um, and I've heard people talk about that when they talk about gait analysis and like when you're walking and there's that feeling and you can watch it sometimes in children where there's, there's that almost falling forward. Yeah, walking is a falling. Yeah. We just catch yourself. <laughs> yeah, so I'm saying all this to say that like I'm coming to identify more this feeling of what I think people mean when they say neutral spine. But it doesn't like sometimes when like maybe you can give us a definition of what you think neutral spine is because I think I don't always know what that feels like. What 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 do you think a neutral spine is? Well, first of all, let's uh, kind of look at the spine as a whole. As you know, the spine is a series of curves. There's three or four main curves, and they're like C's, letter C, stacked up facing in opposite directions. So the neck has a a little curve called a lordosis. The open part of the C would be facing the back of the body. Then your chest has a a, a curve called kyphosis, where the letter C might be open to the front of the body. Your lower back has another lordosis opening to the back. And then your sacrum has another kyphosis spreading forward. So it's like we got four letter C's, kind of two of them are switching directions and they're all stacked on top of each other. Now imagine you took a letter C and straightened it. It would no longer be a letter C. It'd be like a letter I. That's not the way the spine is supposed to work. The spine is a series of curves that flex. The letter C becomes thicker and shallower and then it becomes a little bit longer and that's normal movement. So the idea that we want to have the spine completely straight to get rid of all the curves Yeah, there may be a reason for doing that, but that's not the normal way the spine should be. And it it certainly isn't the way your spine is right now as you're sitting and talking to me. So that's a very unusual position to put your spine in. When you move the pelvis, like if you do a real pelvic tuck where you put your tailbone down, you tend to reduce the curve in the lower back. But if you stick your butt out and point the tailbone up, you increase the curve. And so what Donna Fari was having you doing, was she was playing with how much of a lordotic curve you have. Now, how much is neutral for you, that's hard to tell. That's something that you have to practice with and find out what your neutral is. Because some people have very low muscle tone in their rectus spinae, the big back muscles, or in their quadriceps or the hamstrings, and they just kind of default to a place where the muscles aren't keeping them in this position. It's more relying on the ligaments and the, the joint capsules and the bone. And they've been doing it for so long, it feels normal to them. But it actually may not be their neutral position. So it's, it's kind of hard to really tell people what neutral is because everyone's bones are shaped differently. I think what Donna had you playing with is the way to go is you have to experiment. Have your hands on your hips and kind of tilt the hips back and forward. And at which position do you feel like you're using the least amount of effort and it feels kind of natural? But if you stay there for five minutes, it would be effortful because there's no one static position in the body that's ideal for very long. And that's another myth we have in yoga, that there's one ideal posture that's going to work forever and ever. I think that's right. And I think that sometimes, and this comes a bit from my friend Amy Matthews, it, it, is, it seemed to me like an idea that I have about my spine or my body. Mm-hmm. That like if the idea that I had was keeping my spine like in this extension was optimal, <laughs> yeah. then I, I, I trained myself to keep it that way because I thought that was optimal, but ultimately it led to some, some pain issues and it, it wasn't optimal. And so that yeah. finding this idea of neutral spine, it's interesting what you said, that the least amount of effort, 
There was a little bit of effort to change my idea, though. Like, there's mm-hmm. sometimes an effort required. But when I've identified it, and it's a big theme in your, your new book, it seemed to me as well, is I've really gotten away from using the word strength and using the word stability more. Yes. Yeah. And stability kind of means to me no pain. <laughs> like, yeah. like when I have too much movement and I, when I have too much movement, I have this inflammation pain there. And when that inflammation pain goes away and I'm not putting too much movement there, that's where it feels more stable. Well, you're, you're a victim like, like I was in the early days of my yoga practice of the, the myth of mobility. We want to have the spine as mobile as possible, but that's not what the spine is meant to do. The spine is a coupler between our upper body and our lower body, and it transmits forces in both directions. So the primary function of the spine is stability. In yoga, we got this backwards. We think the primary function of the spine is to be as mobile as possible, to be able to drop back and wheel and grab your ankles. Well, there's no health benefit to that. That's making your spine unstable. Yeah, Leslie calls that the the never-ending pursuit of unlimited flexibility. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I certainly was a kind of victim of that idea. There but is a price to pay. <laughs> there is. And I am an example. And I think that's why so much of what I do now is, spec- is sort of like a, a knitting back together rather than a pulling apart. Mm-hmm. And that really means not going to end ranges anymore. Like I never go to my end ranges. And I know there might be reasons why someone would go to end ranges. But for me, like... By not going to end ranges, my, my body is still engaging in, and having an effort. It's still having some stress and load on it, mm-hmm. but it's just not so much that it's, it's uh, getting me away from this kind of place of a more neutral spine where I'm supported in this, like having my life. Well, you use a term there that I think is getting a little bit abused in, in yoga and therapy and range mm. because that itself is quite a variable. Mm-hmm. I don't have a fear of going to end range. I have a fear of going past my end range. Okay. <laughs> I like that. And, I like and that. your end range varies. Like the first thing in the morning, your end range is, of motion is not very big because you're stiff from sleeping. But after you've been in a hot tub or something like that, your end range of motion is quite a bit more advanced. It's going past where the body stops you. And that's what we prized in yoga in the early days is we want to keep getting more and more and more. And when you reach that end range, you say, well, it's just something I have to overcome, so let's keep pushing. So the end range itself, I don't think is the problem. It's going past it that creates the problem. I get what you're saying. I think for me when I say that not going to end ranges, what I mean is that there's there's an idea of doing as much as you possibly can. Yeah. So... You know, like Mr. Iyengar used to say, uh, you know, you start from 100%, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that idea of taking my body to its, like, maximum, yeah. as opposed to finding the, the balance point, which I know you call the Goldilocks uh, principle, yes. right? Like, that balance. Yeah. We did talk about that was a point of agreement in our first talk, if I remember. <laughs> like, that, that, um, that balance point is what I'm looking for. Right. And I guess if you have been conditioned to not have very good interoception. Like I, I used to associate pain with opening. So if you don't mm-hmm. have a good sense of where your end range is and you're just living beyond it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> that is the challenge. What is my body able to do? And most of us are not trained to pay attention to have that interoception, as you called it. I think one of the biggest gifts a teacher can give the student is the ability to figure this out for herself. Right. Is to give her the ability to say, what is too much for me? And what can I say to you keep going for? Rather than decide that for the student and try to put them like Dabby Joy's putting up foot behind Brian Cass' head and breaking his hip. No, that, that's, that's not appropriate. Mm-hmm. You have to have the student figure out, okay, where is my end range? How do I know it's the end range? Am I there yet? So teaching the students how to pay attention to the body, that's, that's the gift of the teacher. And then the student won't need a teacher anymore. I know. I agree. It's a. It's. It's true to yoga, but not always the best business model. <laughs> no. I think that's why it's a less. In certain regards, it's a less popular notion, the one that you're putting forth, because uh, people needing to come back mm-hmm. uh, has has uh, has has shaped how yoga is taught. Sometimes, you know. 
Well, imagine if your doctor had that, uh, that uh, philosophy. Instead of healing you, I just want to give you enough information that you keep coming back to me. Well, you wouldn't consider that a very good doctor. I know, but I, know that I, don't, I don't think it's a doctor's, but our healthcare system here in America kind of functions that way. <laughs> okay, well, so maybe that's bad. How about, how about a music teacher? I know, I know. I know. I mean, Say you're teaching someone to play bass. Yeah. And do you want them to keep coming back? Yeah, but you can still give them more. As long as you know more than them, they may still keep coming back, but they're yeah. progressing. And they're the ones having to do the work. That's right. I, I talked with um, Judith Hansen Lassiter about this somewhere. You want your students to, like, go off and be better than you, you know? Like, you want them to learn what you're teaching and then not need you anymore. That would be like your greatest success as a teacher. Yeah, I, I, the analogy I often use, Jay, is uh, I'm like an elementary school teacher. And you know, I don't want my students to stay in grade three forever. They're going to learn what I can give them, and then they're going to go on and start specializing and learn from others. And, but there's always other kids coming through. There's always new grade three students. So the teacher doesn't necessarily have to be out of work just because their students graduate. Mm-hmm. I certainly think that there's been quite a, I don't know, I think a move or shift towards a lot of people coming to what I get from you too, in terms of people needing to be able to discern these things for themselves. Yeah. Uh, and that the word interception gets thrown around a lot more these days than it ever has before. And teachers are exploring new things in their classes in terms of, like you're saying, uh, asking questions more. Like, you know, we were talking about neutral spine, you know, even mm-hmm. just someone standing in Tadasana, as you wrote, and, mm-hmm. you know, asking them, you know, to inquire about this idea. <laughs> you know, can you yeah. notice, can you notice about what's going on in your spine rather than telling them to extend? Yeah. You see it all the time still. It's, it's just a habit that people have when you're doing a forward fold, come down with a straight spine. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not a neutral spine. And when you actually straighten the spine, the lumbar is now fully flexed. That letter C is now a letter I, and that's when it's least able to take the stresses of of some of the poses. So with the best intentions of the world, we've actually made the pose more dangerous for a lot of people because we told them to come down with a straight spine. Right. It's the curves of the spine that distribute the stress. Well, I think, and I'm curious to know what you think, that sometimes that comes from like a protective thing. Like if someone has a real injury or like point of acute pain, Mm -hmm. sometimes some axial extension is in order, you know, maybe as like a protective measure, but to then extrapolate that out to meaning we should all be doing it like that all the time is where I think it, it gets confused and problematic. Yeah. When we take something that's a, a prescription for one person and think that everyone should have the same prescription, you, know, you wouldn't take somebody else's medical prescription, but you now you hear that this worked for one student, so we should all do it. You know, you, that's not going to work for everybody. It may work for a lot of people, but it's not going to work for every person. Mm-hmm. So again, I'd rather have the person figure out what's going to work for her or him and work with them to play with that. And that's, that's hard to do in a class setting where you've got 30 students, but it is doable. Mm-hmm. I do think it's doable in a class setting. It, it, even when you're presenting something that is more generalized, which it has to be, because it's not mm-hmm. just two people in a room, but a whole group right. of people from different situations and different lives and bodies, it has to be more generalized. But if what you're presenting includes um, principles like we're talking about, and that's yeah. what you're putting forth along with the forms. I do right. think that people can still get a lot from that, even if it isn't as pure as the one-to-one inquiry, you know? Right. Yeah, it'd be ideal if we could all have our own private yoga teacher one-on-one yeah. all the time, but that's not realistic. So. Well, the other thing that I've been thinking a lot about that kind of dovetails to this, and, it, and you used these words um, just earlier, this, um, this anti-fragility curve mm-hmm. idea. Because, you know, I... I do have kind of like, I, I sometimes call it a set program of forms, but I shouldn't say that because it isn't set. Like it can change a lot every time I do it. What I mean is I often use like the same forms, yeah. sometimes in the same order. And, 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 and I have also like put new things in, like I do pull-ups now, which I never used to do. Yeah. And put in some new things that have been helping me too. And I think it, 
it does bear relevance to this anti-fragility curve. So maybe just for anybody listening who's not heard that before, maybe they haven't read your books yet, tell, tell mm-hmm. us what, a, what the anti-fragility curve is. Okay, well, this is a term coined by a, a financial analyst, Nassim Tlaib, in a book called Anti-Fragility. He was studying the banking systems and realized the crash of 2008 was caused by the banks getting bigger and more fragile until eventually they just broke. Well, the same thing happens in living tissues as well. We're not computers. We're not cars. We, as we get stressed, and I'm using that word again, mm-hmm. <laughs> as we stress our bodies, the body reacts and makes the body stronger. Whereas your computer over time is wearing out. Your keyboard, you're pounding on the keys. They don't repair themselves. Your car brakes wear out over time. They're fragile. But something that's anti-fragile repairs itself if you stress it. So we need to have exercise. We need to have a challenge to the system so that the system can go in and make the area that we just used more usable. And we call this anti-fragility. Now, unfortunately, in yoga and in therapy in general, with the best intentions, a lot of teachers and therapists make this binary. If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.